Hey everyone and welcome back to another edition of my video. Today I've got a uh, a new series that I'm going to be trying to do on this channel um, which is going to be uh, doing some middle game training with you guys. Uh, it's more for my own uh, satisfaction that I'm doing this but I thought I would share some of my thought processes with uh, yourselves as well who are watching the video. Um, so uh, the reason I wanted to start doing this is I think one of the biggest things that I I think I've noticed in my analysis of my own games where I tend to struggle is in the middle game and I think I think that's kind of goes for most most players to be honest with you is it's very easy to uh, end up going for the wrong plans end up um, uh, analyzing the position incorrectly and then uh, finding yourself going down a pathway that uh, leads to your quick demise and um, well what's what I used to do years and years ago when um I was at when I was at university, um one of the things I used to quite like doing was something known as guessing the move. So I'd get to a position, uh maybe sort of just after the middle game, and I would essentially sit there and just have a look at the good position and try and guess the move. Um it was a really good, really good effective training method. I, I used to do it when um when I had uh, my university team um when we would be uh sort of uh, practicing for competitions um, we would have a look at lots of positions and uh, we'd try and like analyze some famous games which has some some sort of analysis to it as well so we can see about some of the uh, the thought processes behind each of the moves and uh, yeah we'll just try and guess what the next move was really really simple so I'm going to do a similar thing with you guys today um, but uh, there was a youtuber called uh, Hanging Pawns who um, essentially uh, shared some of his um, some of his training methods from his coach and this particular one was um, looking at getting like a tournament up looking at a position from move 20 and then trying to analyze the position and work out who is what what the next best move is basically at move 20 so for myself I've decided to um, do this training method um, now what he's recommended is you start with 30 seconds so you look at all the positions from move 20 from 30 seconds right down a move then you do it from three minutes so you look at the positions for three minutes right down a move and then finally what we're going to be doing today with you guys is do a 10 minute analysis of a position and then write down our thoughts and our moves um, the reason we're doing this is to help build our thinking processes so the reason why we're doing the 30 minute 30 seconds is that's going to be very much sort of working on your intuition the three minutes is going to be pretty much your standard amount of time I would say in a, a normal tournament game um, so that's just going to just be you know just getting developing your feel of the position getting it and be able to understand some of the basics of the position and avoiding blunders and when you're looking at a 10 minutes that is kind of going deep deep analysis you know you might want to have one of one or two of these uh, during your games just to uh, really really think about the position really understand the position properly and hopefully at the 10 minute mark we should be able to get the right answer the point of it is as at the end we would then analyze what the actual move was played in the position and then what we would then look at the engine analysis afterwards so I'm going to be sharing with you guys my my thoughts so far so you can see on the screen is a page of my analysis you won't be able to read it but you can kind of see um, there's maybe some of the moves are pretty much the same but otherwise there are some slight changes from the three minutes from the 30 seconds to three minutes but let's now go into um, our 10 minute routine so just so you're aware at the, the tournament I decided to choose um, very very odd tournament I decided to choose was the actual first American uh, chess congress back in 1857. Um, the reason I wanted to do that is because I, I quite like looking at Morphy games. Um, Paul Morphy, this was his famous breakthrough tournaments where he uh, absolutely obliterated every American opponent. And uh, yeah, I just wanted, I just fancied having a look at some of the games from that. Um, the games I would say aren't brilliant. There's a couple of <laughs> moves I found where the solution was like checkmate or just a clear blunder from one player to the other. Um, but at the same time, there's, uh, there are some, um, you know, I think it's still quite nice to have a look because, because a lot of the players are probably no better than yourself and I. And it's interesting to see what their thought processes were back in the 19th century, mid 19th century um, versus what are obviously our modern day analysis these days. 
Okay, so let's have a look. We've waffled for far too long. Let's actually look at the first position. Um, what I'm also going to do is get a timer ready. Um, so let me just get the timer set up. Okay, so I've got the timer all set up. Let's start. All right, so this is the position. So I've already got it set up on my uh, on my Leechess study. So um, let's have a look here. Right, so let, I'll just show you some of the thoughts that I had um, on the three minutes. I just wrote down some quick quick things on here so um, essentially I wrote uh, White has a very good position I think we can hopefully agree on that um, he's got uh, very good space you see his pieces are much more uh, imposing on Black's pieces um, he's got very good development as well all his pieces developed although I don't really particularly like this knight over here um, and I, I think he's got very good position from the looks of it um, if we analyse all of the minor pieces, I mean both of these knights are on the rim, but we could probably safely argue that this knight over here is probably a bit better than the other knight, as at least this one is in an aggressive place. It could at some point, you know, maybe look at jumping into uh, to g6 and start attacking the king. You know, and uh, you know this knight over here is not doing anything. It's probably going to need to reroute its way around, maybe come to uh, e8 or something just to defend the position. I, I definitely don't think Black's doing particularly well here. Um, his position is very cramped. I, I have I see no real counterplay from Black as well. So um, so that's kind of my my base assessment of this position. Um, let's see what other things are interesting about the position. Um, so I think black would love to play a move like e6, trying to break in the center. But of course it's very, very difficult to do that with the queen here. I think also moves like rook here look nice, but of course so there's a bishop here, so that doesn't work at all. So we can safely uh, rule that one out. So it's very difficult for um, for Black to untangle himself here. Um, I think this queen is very aggressively placed, and it's actually not particularly clear how he can uh, manu uh, he can uh, remove this queen. Um, I'm also really liking this hole on e6. Um, I'd love to get maybe a rook into there potentially and that's going to really restrict Black's position. As I say I think Black would love to sort of break out with something like this but he's just not able to. He's, yeah, I've got too many pieces guarding it here. Um, you know you could try and prepare it with moves like Rook here and try and push but I, don't, I just don't think it's going to work. So um, so in my, uh, my initial thoughts, so my 30 second thoughts I had Rook f3 as a move and I was just looking maybe a simple threat of potentially coming around um, to uh, g3 maybe I, I, I'm not I'm not sure that's a particularly great move I think black's quite well defended here but I think actually after you start exchanging off you should start uh, to break through so I think that was my first plan and I can't really see a great way for black to really deal with this plan um, as I say, he can't really ever move this rook, as uh, he's going to lose it to the bishop. And I think we can we can sort of safely say that white's probably a bit better. Um, but with with that said, you know, even black 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 could potentially try and do an exchange sack here just to <laughs> just to survive this position. But um, as I say, I, I can't see how white could be any worse than as a result. So the other move that I had, and this was at the three minute mark, was I quite like the move rook a to e1 and just really putting a clamp on black's position. Um, you know, maybe I can do that first and then start doing this maneuver potentially. But I'm actually starting to quite like this rook f3 to uh, g3 idea. Um, I'm not entirely sure how black can respond to this. So rook to f3, what can black do? Let's see. So this bishop it can't move. This rook as we say can't move either because of the bishop. So 
we've got basically these three pieces that we can move around. So love to get them. Maybe maybe the knight. I can I'm, I can only really see that this this being an okay move just to try and get some added protection over here. Um, just having a look. I mean, even could, could, no G four doesn't work. No. So really, I'm I'm sort of this this is my two two moves that I'm kind of quite convinced are pretty good. I think for a positional sense, rook a to e1 makes sense. So slowly increasing our advantage. Just one thing I've noticed though is this pawn. If this knight came here, he's going to be attacking this pawn then. So maybe as a slight improvement, maybe rook a to d1 is a bit better just to hold on to this pawn. Um, you know, if he lose, if if white was to lose this pawn, black center really starts to sort of um, get get quite big very quickly. Uh, he definitely doesn't want a pawn moving to somewhere like this, as it just blunts out the the bishop. So maybe this is a bit better. Maybe that's a slight improvement. Um, but as I say, I mean, rook to f3. If this knight came here. Just rook to d1 seems safe. Everything's protected, and then we're threatening just to come over here. The next, the following move. So, yeah, I, I honestly don't think there's much else that Black can do. I mean, let's. I mean, one thing I would think about is if I was Black, maybe play a move like uh, King to h8, just to get out of the way. Um, the point being is that this will uh, free up this bishop then. So after after like a move like this, king here, this bishop is now no longer pinned. So it can look at ideas of just capturing. I guess on the other hand we've, we've got this defended, so I don't think that's a huge problem. But actually, even fa in fact, if this ever captured, we just take here, and that's with a check. Rook comes across. Um, we can jump in with a knight. I'll throw in a check as well. So I, I think that's fine. So I'm not I'm not too worried about this move. So rook f3, bishop captures. So sorry, go here, king here. Maybe just go to rook to g3, bishop captures takes. Uh, that's the only move. Knight here, check. King goes here. I mean, I can pick up the uh, the queen, I think, in that line. So definitely doesn't look any good. So yeah, I I think I really like my idea. I think rook rook to f3. I think my thirty second analysis was probably correct. I think here actually is probably not as good as I thought it was because of just this knight move. And I think I'd lose a tempo having to come back to d1. Because there's not really any other way I can defend this pawn uh, effectively. So I think that's probably a mistake there. But I think this is fine as well. Just trying to think of some other ways that can counterplay could occur. I mean, if this knight came to um, b4, is that really a threat hitting this pawn? I guess not. I mean, if we did rook, rook to f3, this knight jumped here. This isn't really a threat, I don't think. Knight captures here. We're just threatening mate pretty soon. So, yeah, that's that's no good at all. Um, yeah, it's quite it's a very nice position for white. I've got to say, I'm I'm very very happy with um with with his position. So we're we're coming up to the end of the 10 minutes now so I'm gonna make make a decision I think I'm gonna go for rook f3 I think this will really uh, it's then a kind of a bit of a race against time if this knight came here we can jump rook to d1 quite safely defending that pawn although this as well this is annoying too 
because then we have to go there. But I think this is the right move. So I'm going to go rook to f3 as my as my answer. And I'll write it into my little thing here. Okay, so that's it. So that's the timer that's now gone. So let's now have a look at the uh, the engine analysis. Okay, so we return to the position. Uh, unfortunately, I had a look, some slight technical difficulties as uh, I couldn't. Uh, I thought there was a way to uh, have a look at multiple lines from Stockfish um, as possible moves, but it's only showing up one. So I had to switch over to uh, Chess.com to get all of the uh, analysis on there. So, um, so these are the three moves, the most uh, most uh, popular moves from the according to the engine, or oh, the best moves, I should say. Um, so it really likes Rook. F to E1, that was his number one choice, and then Rook A to E1 as well. So I guess we were we were right on the three minutes. So I did have that. I guess I didn't really like these moves just because of this potential move to uh, to create a bit of counterplay against this um, this pawn. So I'll just show you an example um, continuation. Knight to C7. Now here. I potentially wow what a move okay so I didn't really see this this tactical uh, brilliancy here <laughs> and that's uh, rook to e6 my gosh okay the point being if I capture here this comes with a very nasty fork so um, yeah this is no good at all for black uh, and he's going to be losing either a queen or a rook uh, if he tries doing something like this, well, we just exchange off and something's going to fall. Maybe we can take, can we take this way? Yeah, we'll take that way, actually. And that's still totally losing. So very interesting. Same applies for this as well. So so although I thought this was a problem, in actual fact, this is not a problem at all. There's a tactical thing that saves us. Now, the good news is the third most popular move and what was also played in the game uh, is uh, rook to f3. Um, now this was the game uh, Theodore Lichtenhain versus Benjamin Raphael. Interesting enough actually Raphael has a variation named after him in the Dutch defence. So there we go, the Raphael variation. Um, so in any case, what's the point of this? So um, rook to f3, as I say, ideas are just coming simply over here. In the actual game Knight came to c7, which is what we what we thought was going to happen. Rook to g3, very simple plan. e5 was played, so black tried to lash out in the center, but d takes on e6, queen takes on e6, but this was in fact a totally losing move. And uh, something I actually didn't consider in terms of the tactical brilliance of this position is now um, white has a fantastic move here, and that is queen takes on g7 amazing so this is what actually happened in the game um, so sacrificing a queen the point being g takes g7 rook takes g7 now you have an incredibly nasty windmill tactic here um, so rook to h8 and actually if i said there's a windmill tactic you could you could play this and i think this is probably winning just as much but uh knight to g6 is just crushing as this will just immediately win the uh, the queen on the spot um, so no other moves everything he has to capture with the knights you take back totally winning this is also comes with a check as well uh, so after this moves well you could well okay just pick up the other knight why not <laughs> crazy stuff and that comes with a check again yeah so there, there's 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 a very very beautiful position. Um, this is actually a mate in four now. At the point being, you'd move your rook around and just deliver mate there. So what a beautiful position. So I was quite happy. So I'm happy I got the results. Um, I perhaps didn't get the plan tactically speaking, but I kind of had the same idea. I wanted to get over to there, maybe you know start threatening uh, mates. I, I think what's quite interesting actually. If I go back to to this position, um, the best move, um, which we did we did discuss briefly, was actually rook to f6. This is what it recommended the most. The point being, um, if we capture captures back, black is I guess parried the queen away in some way. 
um, maybe these pieces aren't as well coordinated as, as White would like but the problem is as you can see we go down material so um, it's perhaps not that good for black uh, even this position um, so there we go uh, quite happy we got that I hopefully see you in the next part where we look at another position